old trails and ghost towns with Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, who is our resident expert, a placer miner, former school teacher, historian, collector, and today we're going to be taking a look at a town in the very south central part of British Columbia, very close to the American border. It's called Rosslyn. What's special about Rosslyn, Bill? Rosslyn was the most famous gold town in British Columbia in the 1890s, and probably right up through the middle part of the teens. And it was so famous, it became known as the Golden City. How did it compare as amount of gold, say, as compared to Barkerville, which predated it? Took out more gold than Barkerville, probably. Uh, depends upon which figures you use. But certainly, one of the mines in Rossland produced over 20 million at the time. That was the famous Leroy. And this would be equivalent to, Mike, if we took the gold price today, over $600 million out of one mine. So the, the mines in Rossland at today's gold price produced well over $1 billion billion dollars. A lot of money. Now, we've heard about some very strange characters who've discovered mines, uh, circus performers who've discovered ore bodies. Who is responsible for discovering the ore in Rossland? Again, two French Canadians. One who was, took all the credit, and the one who really deserved the credit didn't get it. Now, in 1890, a number of miners were streaming over the old Dudney Trail. And two of these miners, a guy called Oliver Bordeaux and a guy called Joe Morris, were working on a, on a claim down there called the, called the Lily May, and this was in the South Belt region, south of, south of Rossland, and south of a peculiar volcanic cone called Red Mountain. Now, they could see Red Mountain across the valley, but they kept on working on the Lily May until another man arrived on the scene, and his name was Joe Bour Bourgeois. And uh, so Bourgeois teamed up with Morris. By this time, uh, Oliver Bordeaux went, went to another area, mm -hmm. and they began working towards this this uh, volcanic cone. And as they went across the valley, uh, Morris staked a, a mine called the Home Stake. And then in the early part of July 1890, they went up a, a draw, which was later called War Eagle Draw. And as they came up, as they came up this draw, they began picking up pieces of float. And float. They, What's that? Well, float is ore that has come off the, the main vein somewhere. And the float was very rich looking, at least to their eyes, and they were fairly experienced. And they staked four claims. They staked the Virginia, the Idaho, the War Eagle, the Center Star. And then, although they were not allowed to, they staked another extension, which they called the Lawise. And then on the 4th of July, which was the big holiday in the, in the, in the Kootenai country, because most of these miners were Americans, mm -hmm. they decided to go to Nelson to replenish their supplies and assay these, these samples they'd taken. So they took the samples into an, uh, to an assayer in Nelson and found that the richest sample only assayed $3.25, and some of them didn't show any metallic content at all. No gold, no silver. They didn't know, but they'd gone to an assayer who wasn't experienced. And at that precise junction, uh, an individual walked down Baker Street in Nelson, a very fascinating man. His name was Eugene Sayer Topping. He'd been an Indian fighter and a poet and a newspaper man, and he had been a jack of all trades. He was an entrepreneur. At that time, he was deputy to mining recorder. And so they said, Topping, are you interested in these samples? So they showed him the samples, and Topping had a very good eye. He looked at the samples, decided he'd take a chance. They said, look, it, if you'll, you'll pay $12.50 for recording these, these claims, we'll give you your choice of the five claims. <laughs> so Topping, smart boy, took the samples to the best assayer in Nelson, and he came back with, with assays of two and three ounces per ton in gold alone, which was spectacular. Well, he, didn't, he neglected to tell, of course, Morris and, and Bourgeois of, of his results, and a couple of weeks later, he went back with them to Rossland, and they walked along what, what is now known as Red Mountain, and he walked over all this ground, and as he walked over the Virginia, he liked it, but not that much. And the Idaho was fairly good. And the, the War Eagle was better. And the Center Star was better yet. But as he got out the edge of Red Mountain, he was on the Lowise. And he said, this is what you call the Lowise? He said, I'll take it. But I'll call it the Leroy, the king. And so in French, he called it the Leroy. And he bought it for $12.50. And that was the beginning of the Rossland Rush. Because the, 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 the strikes on, on Red Mountain were absolutely spectacular. 
Oh. And what happened, of course, is that he sold his, his share in the Leroy, all of it, for about $30,000. The Leroy produced millions and millions and millions of dollars for a bunch of sharp operators from the Inland Empire around Spokane. Okay, we're going to talk about Rossland today. When we come back, we'll see some of those wonderful historic photographs that tell us so much about that time when Rossland was the golden city. Be back right after this break. Welcome back. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley talking about Rossland. So Morris gets all the credit, but really it's Bourgeois who did the finding of these big ore bodies. Yeah, I, I, there's not much doubt about that. Bourgeois was a mine finder. Morris was not. Bourgeois proved that by later on discovering the, the, the very rich gold placers on the Bull River. And then soon after that, he discovered the famous North Star Mine, which was at one time the premier silver mine of British Columbia. And, and then, he, then he kind of disappears. He walks off the historical stage. And then this guy, Topping, gets all this money and then gives it away. This is what uh, we're talking about Rostin looking like early on. Yeah, this is, this is Sourdough Alley, and this is when Rossland is just, they've just made a strike at the, at the War Eagle and the Center Star, and Patsy Clark has hit spectacular ore, ore that ran from two ounces to over 20 ounces a ton. And so they threw together a town, and this is the kind of a crooked thoroughfare that went through the town. This is the first main street of Rossland, 1895. Sourdough Alley. And they already had delusions of grandeur, palace, livery. Oh, sure. Remarkable. A little bit later on. Actually, about the same time, Mike, this is 94 and 95, and this is Columbia Avenue. This is a, the rival main street of Rossland, and uh, this eventually became the main street. And this is the beginning of Columbia Avenue, the false front buildings going up. Now, you've already mentioned a number of names, all which are fascinating, the Topping and the Bourgeois and the Morrises, but there's another name in here. Do you call him the Boy Millionaire? The, yeah, the Boy Millionaire. You're talking about now a guy called Fritz Augustus Heinz, and he made his millions. Actually, he was a multimillionaire by the time he was about 24. And he came from Butte, Montana, heard about the strikes in Rossland, decided to get in there on the ground floor, but he was a little bit late. He was a little bit late because the, the Sharpies from the, from the Inland Empire around Spokane, guys like General Warren and Patsy Clark and, uh, and the bartender Billy Harris, they beat him to it. So he said he came into Rossland, he couldn't purchase any of the major mines, so he went down about six or seven miles away and started a smelter and trail and eventually sold that smelter to the CPR, went back to Butte, Montana, made millions more and eventually lost uh, his entire fortune, $50 million, at that time that would be about a billion dollars, on, on Wall Street. Fritz Augustus Hines. Yeah, fascinating character. All right. The, of course, we're talking about people who made the millions in the mines, but there were hundreds, thousands of people who just worked for wages. Who are these guys? Sure, these are the guys. These are prob this is probably the center star, and it shows one, one, of, the, uh, one of the ore cars, and they're, they're pushing the ore cars into the center star and working, going, drilling right into, putting tunnels right into Red Mountain. And they, they had hundreds of miles of tunnels in Red Mountain. Now, we've talked in other shows about the sticking Johnny, and that's what we've got right here. This is, we finally meet, the ever-popular sticking Johnny. And what precisely is it? Well, the sticking Johnny, they'd have a little candle right here, and they would stick this into one of the timbers, and this would let them, they'd be at the face of the, uh, of the ore, and they could, they could see when they, were, when they were trying to drill out the ore. So, th really, their only light being down in the mines was from this candle? At that time, yes. Later on, they'd use carbide lamps. So, we have a... Uh a carbide lamp here, which is, uh, when did it come in as compared to the candle? Well, the hard hats and the carbide lamps came in much later. This, this would be 1920s when Rossum was approaching the end. And we talked with carbide, about carbide lamps before. There's a fluid that goes in the top here. What's that, just water? Yeah, just water. And uh, carbide, what is carbide that goes down well, in the bottom? Well, carbide uh, acts with the water itself. The water drips on the carbide and produces a a spark and then uh, you have a flame varying from a few inches to a couple of feet if you want. So a guy would light his lamp by just having the, uh, the, the flint in there and flick that mm -hmm. and that yes. would set the gas off and yeah. I guess this would show a heck of a lot better than that little candle would. Ah oh, yeah, much better. Why, being down in the darks of the mines with only a candle, you had to be a nerves of steel kind of person. Some of the miners grew to like it. They <laughs> grew to like it? Yeah. Well they were a, a strange brood oh, I guess. Yes. Where are we looking here? What, what part of the country are we looking at well, right this now? Is, this is the War Eagle and probably the Nickel Plate beyond that. And two of the mines are on Red Mountain. 
and uh, you know, it shows some of the activity. Those are large mines. It's it's uh, pretty impressive. What's the uh, the uh, walkway or the or the some sort of conduit that goes up to that stack in the center of the picture? Yeah, well, they worked they worked winter and summer, so that was a covered walkway, so they wouldn't be slipping on the ice. So they actually covered the walkway to get to the uh, to the shaft house on top. All right, and that's one of the mines. And this shows the Santa Star and the War Eagle, another shot, and two of the other mines, and two great producers in Rossland. Now, with the War Eagle and the Santa Star, they, they're two separate mines, two separate shafts, two separate claims? That's correct. They're close together. I mean, uh, this, they're side by each up here. Yes, they are. And they became so famous that eventually these Rossland mines uh, led to the, uh, the commencement of the Toronto Stock Exchange. Is that right? Yeah. Now, th so each one of these mines, there was no sort of uh, centralization. These were still owned by separate people and still produced that way. Yes, yes, they were. They were separate entities. And this shows sort of the, 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 three, uh, the, th the three of the major producers. Yeah, it shows the major producer on the right-hand side, and that is the famous Leroy. Which was, the, what was it called originally when was, this guy talked? It was him? called the Lawise originally, but it produced about 40 tons of gold alone, as well as silver and copper. And then it also shows the, the War Eagle, and over on the left-hand side, it shows the Josie, which was also a very good producer. We used to play on these mines when I was a kid all the time. Because you grew up in Rossland. Yeah, I spent many of my formative years there. Fire is a, so much a part of every town we've talked about, it seems to me. Uh, did the whole town of Rossland go with this one? Not in this one. This is 1902. In fact, the infamous uh, International House, or hotel on the right-hand side, was not affected. This is looking up Spokane Avenue, and it was, it was a fairly serious fire, but not as serious as the fire of 1929. Tell me about the, there's probably a story in the International House. Uh, there's always one of these uh, places. Yes, unfortunately, most of the stories can't be told. Uh, they were, <laughs> there were high stakes gambling games. Uh, um, it was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, there were rather some infamous characters uh, uh, frequented the, uh, the, the famous International House. And there had to be a, a man bigger than uh, the Times itself to, uh, to, to, uh, control this activity. Yeah, this is, this is Big John Kirkup, or Big Jack Kirkup. He was the mountain sheriff in Rossland for about a year and a half, and he was probably the most famous lawman in British Columbia in his day. Was about six feet, five inches tall, weighed about 315 pounds, and kept the law with a shot-loaded cane, and also carried a colt as kind of backup. Now, that's a bit of a rarity, isn't it? In, in, in Canadian history, a, a, a colt sidearm is not what you'd regularly find. Well, it's debatable, Mike. In early years, perhaps that's, that's, that's true. But uh, certainly, th this, by the way, is Kirkup's original Colt and uh, 1875. And he carried that in case he needed uh, backup, but usually he didn't. His lead shot cane would, uh, would serve the purpose perfectly well. Oh, sure. He walked into Spellman's saloon in, 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 in the early years when he was there in Rossland, and they were, they were shooting at each other. The gamblers, uh, a high-stakes poker game came apart at the seams, and he just waited in with a shot-loaded cane, and about five minutes later, he was the only guy left in the saloon. Some of the characters you're talking about, some of the, the ladies of the evening, uh, Scrap Iron Who? <laughs> so, yeah, well, there's, there's Popcorn Kate and Scrap Iron Nelly and uh, a number of individuals who frequented the red light district in Rossland. Rossland had, remember, Rossland was a hard rock mining town. There were thousands of men working on the hill. Uh, Columbia Avenue was busy day and night. It had over 40 hotels. It had two railroads coming into the town. It had an opera house. It had the Rossland Club, where all the major deals were struck. The famous Allen Hotel. So it was, it was the fourth largest city in British Columbia, and it, people thought it would last forever. They thought the mines in Red Mountain would go down probably three or 4,000 feet, and some of them went down over 1,000 feet. Remarkable story. This is all perking along around 1900 in south-central British Columbia. Right. Yeah, perking along, to say the least. There's, a, I, I guess, an early shot uh, showing just sort of the commerce on the street, right? Yeah, that's close, that's close to the turn of the century. And uh, this is actually a parade. It's probably either 4th of July or 24th of May. And I would think 4th of July, this particular one. And it shows some of the floats, uh, you know, put out by the, the various businesses in Rossland and a bit of a crowd gathering on the street. So a little hard to date some of these photographs, but what you've identified is that there aren't very many power poles in that shot, but here you even see the West Kootenai Power and Light sign. That's right. You can see that on the left-hand side. And the West Kootenai Power and Light started in 1896. So this is probably just after the turn of the century. And and it shows Rossland, a winter scene in Rossland, and winter lasts there about six months. And on the right-hand side is Mount Roberts. And over to the right of that, beyond the picture, would be Red Mountain.
And uh, the snow is what we come to know Rosslyn for today. I mean, Nancy Green, Red Mountain, and sure. all that. That's a long way down the line. As you already pointed out, you were raised in this country and picked up hundreds and hundreds of coins and tokens sure. throughout that area. Yep. And where did you find most of these? Most of these were found on the boardwalk in Rossland, and uh, we found them between what we call the bus depot and, and Hunter Brothers' big store. And uh, we would go there as kids and just, just look through the sand and gravel underneath and didn't think of screening it at all, Mike. Yeah. And as soon as we got some coins, which are usually Victorian coins, occasionally a gold coin, we would run off to the theater and spend our, uh, our easily gotten gains. Some of them are very are wonderfully struck. This one with a very fancy outside DS pounded yeah. in the middle. Would that indicate the guy who owned it? That's he... right. And that's one of the only maverick in, on all these tokens here. In other words, we're not sure of the owner there, but it was found under the boardwalk in Rossland, so we assume it was a Rossland token. So there are little treasures, and these are some of them. And some, I guess they're now uh, encased in the concrete of the existing town. Oh, certainly. I mean, that's all. The original boardwalk, which was standing when I was a kid, yeah. is now gone. And it's asphalt. They had lots of things to occupy their time, obviously working 12 hours a day in the mine, but occasionally they got a day off. What are they doing here? Actually, the mine, the mine, the early <laughs> mining law was changed to eight hours a day thanks to Rossland Miners and the Rossland Western Federation of Miners. So that these guys worked eight hours a day, but they worked usually seven days a week. But occasionally when a holiday came along, they'd have a drilling contest. This is a single jacking drilling contest, and a guy was given 15 minutes to drill as deep as he could into a solid piece of granite. And if he was successful and beat everyone else, there would be a considerable prize of several hundred dollars and thousands and thousands of dollars changing hands between the onlookers who would bet on the various teams. Uh, we should have a, a single jacking demonstration here because I don't think anybody knows what it is to drive a piece of square steel into a rock. Well, actually, the steel, the steel is eight-sided, and the, what, they, the, what they did, it was a double-jacking contest. One man would hold the steel for a couple of minutes, and the other one would turn it about an eighth of a turn each time, and he would hit, be hit with a, with, a, with a sledgehammer and drive it down. Then they'd have change, ha change steel, and they'd quickly change in a, literally a second or two and the other man would take over because, of course, pounding the steel and it was the most difficult work. And how far could they get into a piece of uh, granite? Uh, probably over 40 inches, a very good team, and that's in 15, in 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah. And the reason for that, obviously, is to what? Put a charge in and blow it up well, and get sure. the ore down? This is to see how fast they were in the mine. Gosh, and they had to do that all day. That was their job. Yeah, they wouldn't work that pace all day. What are these guys doing? This is a hose wheel race in Rossland in 1913, and they would run down the street for about 100 yards and uh, see how long it would take them to run 100 yards, and they would get a prize for it. You can see the opposing team, one of the opposing teams off on the left-hand side, watching their, their rivals run down the street. Casting aspersions on their attempt, undoubtedly. Yeah, and this is, this is the way they went to the fires. Dragging a hose reel, and uh, did they have fire hydrants and stuff like that there, or did they have to carry pumper trucks? What did they... Oh, no, they had, they had, there was, this was before the pumper trucks. Yeah. And here's a parade. It seems that the, the historic photographers came out for parades. Yes, indeed. This is, this is looking up uh, Spokane Street, which is just off Columbia Avenue. And this is probably 1914, late August of 1914. And this was the first contingent of Rossland men to go to the, f the Great War, the World War I. And this is probably the 54th Kootenai Battalion. And it's unfortunate, but most of the men who went in the first contingent of the 54th Kootenai Battalion did not return. It was literally annihilated in the various battles of World War I. You had a couple of uncles who were in that battalion, weren't they? Yes, one of them was in the 54th Kootenai and the other was in an Okanagan regiment. And they're both 19 years old and uh, they died within 24 hours of each other. G big, big men, six feet, one inches tall, but really they were just kids. They were 19 years old. Not many came back and so many volunteered and went. Yes, that's true. Remarkable story. This is, the railway is a part of everything we've ever talked about, with the exception of, uh, I guess, some of the early placer operations. Mm -hmm. uh, how many railways came into Rosslyn? Two, the Red Mountain Railway and later on the CPR. And uh, Fritz Augustus Heinz put the first one in, and the CPR eventually extended that to standard gauge. And uh, this is a shot of the CPR and the, uh, the railway station at Rosslyn. And it's a rather interesting photograph because there are no dogs in sight, because dogs just avoided the, the, the uh, train stations because they were, they were petrified about the, uh, of the locomotive and the, and the steam hissing out of it and so on. And in the background... <laughs> it was the largest cat they've ever <laughs> run across, I guess. <laughs> What's in the background? Sorry. The background is, uh, is a brass band. And this may be uh, Professor Antoniolo's brass band from Rossum, which in its day yeah. was quite famous, Mike, because they thought that this was really a world-class band and they decided to go on a world tour. 
and their first stop was Spokane. And Spokane thought it, before they played that they were a world-class band too, but they weren't a world-class band because after the first night in Spokane, the, the headlines in the papers read next day, go back to the mines. One <laughs> night from the Rossland band is too much. <laughs> so they, they slunk back into Rossland, of course. The shortest world tour on record. Oh, yeah. Poor old uh, <laughs> Professor Antoniolo. Yeah, I believe so. Something like that. All right, then we take a look at the town at its heyday. I guess this is, this is it covered the entire mountain. Yeah, it did. This, this is about 1910, and Rosslyn was really a, a boom town, and it remained a boom town right through 1910 until about 1929, until finally they got down too deep in the, in the mines on, on Red Mountain, and the CMS, which was the big company that now controlled the mines at that time, decided to close down the hill, and they closed the hill down, and... Um, that was essentially the end of Rossland as a mining town. Population at its heyday? About 8,000. Biggest, fourth biggest town in British Columbia. Fourth largest city in British Columbia. And it produced a lot of money. It produced, the, the figures vary, but probably equivalent to well over $1 billion in today's price of gold. Okay. Take a break. Be back in a second with more of Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Look at Rossland. Don't go away. Welcome back. I'm Mike Roberts with Bill Barley. Gold Trails and Ghost Town is looking at Rossland today. Treasure stories are always a thing I like to touch on. We, we can't tell a, maybe the best Rossland treasure story, but we can tell a, about a lost mine. Yeah, there are several supposedly lost mines in the Rossland area. One was the famous Iron Door. And whether or not it exists, we don't know, Mike, but the possibility is still there because Rossland wasn't just Red Mountain. There was the South Belt region, there was the OK Mountain, there was the Velvet area. So there were a number of areas around Rossland that produced prodigious amounts of gold, especially in the OK Mountain region where the so-called so uh, Iron Door Mine is supposed to be located somewhere in that area because they had mines like the IXL and the Midnight and the Snowdrop. And some of those mines were so rich they produced the second richest ton of gold ore in Canadian history. One ton yielded almost half a million dollars in gold at today's prices. One ton, which is about this big. That, that ore, what, 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 <laughs> that was a huge amount of gold in each, each it, bucket load. It was spectacular. That was the Linz and the Osings and all these, these old leaser miners who knew the Rossland area extremely well. And, uh, and it was probably richer than that because they had it actually piled outside in the, in the C, one of the CMNS uh, areas. And as each man came off shift, he, he helped himself to the best ore. So all they got was the second rate ore, and that proved to be astonishingly rich. Now, these guys were the, I guess, the originators of conspicuous consumption, were they? Uh... Oh, yeah. They were, they, were, they were doing so well that some of these guys were buying themselves a new car every few weeks. It was just that good. They just buy one, wreck it, and buy another That's one. That's right. It was in the midst of the Depression, too. Why, why do you refer to it as the lost mine? I mean, is, is, how can you lose a mine, especially with all the tailings and stuff associated well, with it? Well, you know, a number of lost mines have been, have been found in that area and also lost, and we do have definite proof. We'll save most of that for another program, but there's some fascinating stories out of the Kootenays about lost mines or lost leads. All right. Bill Barley, thank you very much. The story we've been looking at is Rossland, the Golden City. Join us next time for Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Bye-bye.